It was one of the most perplexing songs of the 1990s. Everyone had their own interpretation of what they thought this number one alternative hit meant. Up next, we get the true story straight from the creator and singer of this song. You're gonna find out the true meaning behind a 90s classic next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you love music, classic rock, classic pop, the whole thing, uh, this channel is really for you. Subscribe below to get our daily content. You know, we have some new merch. It's called the Vintage Years Collection. We have the big four of a classic year in music. Uh, you can see that if you click up there. And then take a gander at our Patreon uh, where you can get more content. Both of these things help us to curate more interviews and more videos. The goal is to keep the music alive. So it's time for another edition of our show, Revelations. Uh, this is where featured artists go very deep into their greatest songs and albums. You get a double dose this week. So in early 1997, a band called The Verve Pipe released a dark and wondrous song called The Freshman. We won't be any freshmen. It was the third single from their second studio album called Villains. The song became the band's breakthrough. It went to number one on the alternative charts. It went to number five on the, the Billboard Hot 100. Uh, went to number six in Canada and also number 28 in Australia. It was a song that started uh, quite a few urban legends. What people thought that it meant. Such a haunting song. I've heard at least uh, four or five different myths about what the you know, song means. Just so happens that I had the chance to talk with lead singer and songwriter of the Verb Pipe, Mr. Brian Vander, a great guy. And he tells us the story, as well as the process of creating uh, one of the defining songs, haunting songs of 1997. As we go into this song, uh, and this interview, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. In my own experience of uh, wearing Zennies for almost a year now, they have the best frames on the market. So cost effective. I mean, you can get two to three pairs for what you'd pay for uh, something elsewhere. You can have a pair in every color, every style. Design your own at Zenny.com. You won't regret it. Here's Brian with the story. There are songs that that come out, they become like the checkpoints of your personal history right right and whenever you hear them it takes you right back to that moment the, not all songs are like that but i remember exactly where i was i was in my early 20s and when i heard the freshman it it stopped me dead in my tracks and i was like wow we won't be any freshmen. what is this this is this is something to behold and i immediately went out, bought the album, and listened to it, and really, really became one with the song, as they say, where you really listen to every word, and you're trying to figure it out. And that's what I've always loved about songs, when you're, you're trying, it's a mystery, and, and there's something that you're trying to figure out. And of course, huge hit, number five on the pop charts, on the Billboard Hot 100, number one on the alternative, number nine on the modern rock charts, number seven on the adult pop, six on the rock charts, six in Canada. I mean, it was, it was a crossover hit all over. And there, what's great about the song is so many urban legends. I heard right. when the song came out, I heard so many different people. I had my interpretation, which ended up being correct, but I heard people say, oh, well, it's about suicide. It's about murder. It's about abortion. Yeah. It's about um, the falling through the ice part. Oh, that's, he killed his girlfriend or something. And, yeah. and it, it's just, that's what's great about pop music or, or popular music is, is it's called that we all have our own interpretation of it. First of all, what is the song really about? The song is about a couple of guys that did uh, something that they would later regret. That was the germ of the idea. When I was young, I knew everything. That we can get away with these things because we're young. Can't be held responsible. In this particular song, the story is that 
these two guys went out with the same girl and one of them got her pregnant. She didn't know who, which one was the father. Like one went out with her and then broke up and another guy went out with her and broke up with her and they went back and forth and they were friends. We were merely flash men. But she was just kind of the girl that hung out and uh, was, you know, uh, you know, the friend with benefits. She a punk who rarely ever took advice. And then she gets pregnant and she she had an abortion. Stop a baby's breath and a shoe full of rice. No. Uh, that part of the story is true. That was me and a friend. After that, I took poetic license and had her commit suicide. That's a that in my opinion is I, something I regret. <laughs> I think that that's a real Neil fight songwriter thing. Go for the throat, the real drama. Now I'm guilt stricken, sobbing with my head on the floor. So there are a couple of lines in there that I still regret, but I mean that's the gist of the song. And funny you say that about it stopped you in your tracks and that, you know, what is the song about? Everything you just described about the song, which I love, goes against everything I learned initially from Harry Chapin and the songwriting thing is that I didn't tell the story simply. I didn't go from this to this to this. I put so much of the, you know, took so much poetic license, so much uh, ambiguity in it that it's confusing to people what it's about. That worked for our advantage, like you just said. It's like because people are talking about it and what's it about? It's about this, it's about that. They're talking about a song that we wrote, you know, a three and a half minute song, and that helped propel it to the top of the charts. I think because there was nothing else like it that was on alternative radio at that time. You know what I mean? There's a story here. Listen to the story. You know, Jeremy, you know, by Pearl Jam was close. And that was probably one of those songs I did the same thing, scratch my head, what happened? And then the video came out and gave it all, kind of gave it all away. Our video doesn't really give anything away. We, tried to wash our hands of all of us. we wanted to propel that narrative of, you know, what what is this? What's going on here? And to this day, people still come up and, and tell me what their interpretation is. And that's another thing I'll say, too, about songwriting. I feel strongly that when I'm writing a song, that song is mine, right? The Freshman is my song. As soon as somebody else hears it, it's their song. That's theirs. It's no longer my song. You know what I mean? And I feel that way about all, uh, all songs that I hear. Once I hear a song and I get my own interpretation, it's mine. But once I write a song and, it, and somebody else hears it, that's their song. I'm not, I can't do anything about it. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I can't change anything. So let them go with it. Well, the song has appeared in, in a lot of different ways. You recorded a few times. Tell me about, because acoustic style, and then it was recorded a second time and released on your album Villains, but then Jack Joseph came in. Yeah, well, I, you know, I wrote the song on the acoustic guitar, and so the very first album, before the Verve Pipe was even together, I had already had that song in my hip pocket, and uh, an acoustic version already recorded. For the love of me, I cannot remember Made us think. And when we signed with RCA after the two albums were out and they came out and saw that the entire theater was singing the song with me, they knew, OK, well, that's, you know, that's a hit song. We got to redo it and make it a little more alternative or grunge sounding to fit with radio. For the life of me, I cannot remember. As record labels do and they should do. Uh, especially back then when it mattered so much, or radio mattered so much. Uh, and so we went in to record it with, uh, we wanted to include it on our album Villains, uh, which, which Jerry Harrison produced. And Jerry Harrison had a different approach to the song. He wanted the song to be a little more mellow. He wanted it, uh, he wanted the story to jump out more and not be, uh, not sound con everything sounds convoluted when you put too much production on there you know you put the heavy guitars or whatever and suddenly your ears drawn to the guitars and not to the story i think that was his idea and i suggested well why don't we do kind of a chris isaac thing you know 
uh, kind of make it mellow and dreamy, you know, wicked game or whatever, that kind of thing. And he like, oh, I love that. And so we did that. And then the song ended up being six minutes long. <laughs> Which was like, okay, well, this, clearly this is not going to work. So our a and guy came in and said, D- I, he almost fell asleep listening to it. He was so bored with it. And he said, and we argued it and fought it. And I said, no, we can get radio behind a six and a half minute song or whatever and play. It. And now, now I know how, re- I know it's happened before me, you know, this in, 19, in the seventies, you know, I'm your captain. I'm your captain. And so, you know, he's in, he, he tells a story now. He told me that, you know, at that point I was like, I knew I wasn't going to get out of you guys what I wanted. So I said, I would figure it out later. And he did, you know, when photograph hit and did pretty well. Then our second single was called cup of tea. And it it really was not anyone's cup of tea. (laughs) Radio's cup of tea. At least I can say that. And so suddenly, you know, they're going to they're going to pull the record. And they're like, and I'm like, wait a minute, we talked about five singles. And they're like, no, this, you know, cup of tea really ruined it for everything. And Brian said, let's talk to Jack Joseph Puig. Brian Maloof was our a and guy. Let's talk to Jack Joseph Puig and see if he can do something with this. And he did. And, and we went in and we weren't used to recording the way he wanted to record with everybody sitting around in a circle and recording there at the moment, usually you build the track with the drums and then the bass and the whole thing. But he had us all sit in a, you know, a, a candle lit, you know, ocean way, which, which there's 10,000 candles in there or whatever. And we kind of like rolled our eyes being, oh, vibey, vibey thing, you know, but Jack, it's Jack Joseph Puig, you know, he made great records. The Grays record, one of my favorite uh, records, you know, Jellyfish worked with those guys. That is why. You go, okay, well, we're going to trust him. And, uh, and he recorded that version. We played the song maybe 20 times and he said, we got it. I, I think we got it. And then listening back to it, I said, man, Jack, I can hear my foot pedal. I can, you know, when I click on the distortion and the bridge, I hear a little click and he said, yeah, it's amazing. Isn't that great? And I wasn't anything that I had learned from Jerry Harrison, which is everything's got to be pristine. And you know, the, the pro tools was taken over then and that kind of thing. And I was like, you know what? That is kind of awesome, you know? And, uh, and so we have this very, I uh, hate to throw this, this word is bandied around too much, but it was kind of an organic thing that it felt the band was playing really well together at that point. And I, and I feel like we really nailed it. We really nailed it. And, and that was because of Jack Joseph Puig. You know, three months later, it's a two months later, it's a it's a it's a big hit already, you know. So no. and then they had to, you know, here's here's the issue you have though. Because we had already released the album with the old version of the of the you know, had the Jerry Harrison version of on the album for the first two hundred thousand that were sold. And then suddenly MTV comes out with this freshman and people are like, wait a minute, this isn't the one that's on my album. What's going right. on? And so we had a ton of complaints. We had people about and then the early fans about the acoustic version that it wasn't the same that we changed it that we sold out you know so we had complaints from every side which is fine when you're making a million dollars off of something it's easy to go okay whatever 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 i mean this is a hit song now you know buzz clip and the whole thing it was and still is a bit of an arduous process i still have people you know, that want us to play the old school version of the freshman, you know, the very first version. And, and they still, we don't, you know, but whatever. <laughs> but that's one of the caveats to going in and getting it right. It really, Jack Joseph Puig knew what we needed to do to get it on radio and knew what, you know, what radio is going to embrace and, and what part of the song they're going to, you know, lean into. And that was the heavier guitar version that we did. And even up until the time we recorded the video, the vice president of RCA made us record the video twice. Once with the original version, not the original 92 version, but the Jerry Harrison version, the sleepy version, we call it. Tried to wash our hands of all of this. 
And then the Jack Joseph Pui video. So we had two completely separate videos of the same song, uh, you know, by the same director and the same actor and the same look and everything, but lip syncing to each version of that. They still didn't know at that point what was going to be the bigger hit. Well, I've talked to Jerry before, and I, that must have been incredible to work with such a creative producer and musician. I mean, talking heads, are you kidding me? Getting the call from Jerry to come record in San Francisco uh, and live on houseboats and record in the record plant where Fleetwood Mac recorded rumors and, you know, where Metallica is currently recording, you know what I mean? and living on houseboats in the San Francisco Bay. This is a kid from Michigan who was li who literally is living in a storage unit writing these songs, you know. Uh, it was just like, just pinch me. You know, how could it, how could it be more amazing? The experience itself was, was difficult with Jerry, but, you know, everybody has their own process, you know. He had a very, he had a very relaxed process we were very, let's go, we're Midwestern boys, you know, and we're like, you know, we're Midwest, Midwestern work ethic and we get there at nine in the morning and the studio opens at 9.30 and we're ready to go. And Jerry's, you know, going sailing and going to show up at three and then he comes in at three and then you eat a little bit and then, but it's all, it's all his process of setting the vibe and let's relax and let's enjoy this process. This is, these are things I didn't know back then. Let's break down the song, if you don't mind. When I was young, I knew everything and she a punk who rarely took advice. She a punk who rarely ever took advice. Well, the idea is to set it up like we're both, we both know everything and we're not going to listen to anybody else. We're young. We're, uh, you know, it, no matter how, and I have her in mind when I, when I think of this, no matter what I would tell her, what direction she should go, what she should do. She was an artist. Uh, she didn't want any of it. You know what I mean? She did her own thing. And I found that intoxicating. That to me was what I wanted to do. Um, and so talking about when I was young and knew everything and she a punk career, they took advice. I'm guilt stricken sob and I'm going to jump ahead because I'm trying like a movie. I want to entice somebody and say, well, wait a minute, what's going on? Why are you sobbing? You know? And then there's a baby and you know, you're stopping a baby's breath, you know, and the shoe fall. Right. So you've got these little elements that you're teasing someone to want to continue to listen, to see how, what becomes of these random you know, uh, images, you know, and how it come, uh, how it, you know, how it all works together in the end. And by continuously repeating the, you know, guilt stricken sobbing with my head on the floor, it made the song catchier. Now I'm guilt stricken sobbing with my head on the floor. And it's like familiar by the time you get to the second, you know, the second verse. And then the chorus itself, the same thing, repeat that same chorus. And by the end of it, you got the gist of the story, although there are still questions. I like how it's straightforward on certain parts, but then very ambiguous on other parts. That's what makes it such a exhilarating song. At, at that point, when I realized what was happening, when I, my, uh, I guess my education for songwriting is always repeat that chorus. I was a big fan of the 70s, you know, uh, 70s, 60s, 70s, you know, the chorus is repeated and you know, over and over and then you get a bridge. So A, B, A, B, C or whatever uh, songwriting. That was me just going, okay, I'm going to repeat the chorus because it's catchy and that's it. And I'm going to repeat part of the, you know, pre-chorus. Let's throw in some curveballs through the verses. And then bring them all back, push them away, bring them back, push them away to figure it out, then bring them back, bring them back home. I mean, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a technique that works in the movies for me, you know, the same thing. Yeah, so, and, uh, and like I said, I work. Now, there are two lines there at this point when I first wrote the song, you know, there were two lines that I didn't have. And I'd been working on the song for six months 
And the two lines I didn't have were, we were merely freshmen. I didn't even have that they were freshmen yet. We were merely freshmen. You know, as far as I knew, they didn't go to college, these two guys, because I didn't go. I mean, I went to a junior college. Uh, so it is a college. I don't want anyone, people to say it's not, I mean, that I was it's not a college. It's a college, but you know, anyway. Uh, and I didn't have that they were freshmen, but I had, uh, yeah, I had the melody. And so I was walking around the house, you know, got to make some breakfast, you know, <laughs> got to quit my day job. You know what I mean? It's like, you're just trying to figure out what that line is, you know? And I was sitting there, uh, before work, I worked at a sporting goods store and the T MTV was on in the corner and with the volume down and I was noodling around with this thing. And I was, what is this? What, it, what is this last line? This could potentially be the title of the song. I got to get it right. It drove me crazy. And I looked down on the coffee table and there in the coffee table was the movie a VHS copy of the movie I had rented the night before. And that was with Matthew Broderick and Marlon Brando called the freshman. The Freshman. The son I never had. Oh. And I went, holy, that's it. These guys were freshmen in college. That's why everybody can kind of forgive them and say, well, they were, you know, we all did these things in college, you know. So it was perfect. And that, that fell right into my lap. After six months, it fell in my lap. And the other line the other random line that I get asked about more than anything was she was touching her face. She was touching her face. What does that mean? On the TV, I told you MTV was on, on the corner of MTV, the video for the Divinals, I Touch Myself was on and she was laying back like this. And I, and I was like, she was touching her face. It rhymed and everything. And I was like, oh my God, this is perfect. It didn't really make sense with the song other than it's kind of a sexy move. Uh, but still, you know, these are little gifts from the universe that happen. Uh, those little random things. The rest of it, you know, came together pretty nicely. But those two things that changed the course of the song, especially the title, you know, happened by circumstance. Stop a baby's breath and sh shoe full of rice. I always thought that was great because the imagery of no wedding and stop a baby's breath and without just coming right out and saying it. Baby's breath and a shoe full of rice, no. You got that right. I wondered about the no, shoe full of rice, no. Oh, that's a, that was a throwaway. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you get, yeah, I, I totally understand if you're trying to interpret it, want to know if you've got it right. And then, <laughs> you throw in one of those little extra things. No, yeah, whatever. Neil Diamond does that all the time with babe. Yes. Babe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, babe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Baby, baby. Ooh, baby. <laughs> Never thinking that, first of all, you got the interpretation of shoe full of rice, stop a baby's breath, which most people don't even get. Um, but yeah, I probably threw you off with the no, but it sounded good. <laughs> I won't be held responsible. She fell in love in the first place. I love that line because it does go with the freshmen of them kind of making an excuse or saying we were merely freshmen. She fell in love in the first place. When you have a, a tragedy or something happen in your life, especially when you're young, you're trying to find excuses or things to make you feel better. You spend your life on these things, on these things that you might regret. And I think that you're, I think the human reaction to anything that you've done where you know it's your fault and you know you have a, you know, a tremendous weight on you that could weigh you down for the rest of your life, you immediately start making concessions and, you know, you start, yeah, yes. Uh, and that I think is the truest thing about that song. But then immediately you're saying, for the life of me, I cannot remember what made us think that we were wise and we'd never compromise. That's what I love about the song is that you're ha this person is having a conversation in their mind that the battle that goes on in your mind of guilt and and shame and, and the whole yeah. the whole uh, the whole process. It never leaves you. These things that you do, they never they never really leave you.
you know, and whether you have some sort of visceral response to a movie uh, because it reminds you of something you did and you lose it, which happens to me on occasion, uh, or not, whether it happens or not, it is inside of you. It's part of who you are, you know. And I think that these two guys, uh, these two characters, um, still feel that, you know. So. For these sins, we will merely flash men. Cannot believe we'd ever die for these sins. Um, just some great lines in there. Thank you. We don't make mistakes. We're no, we're no saviors and we're not, you know, you know what I mean? Uh, I went through years, you know, I grew up in a very, very Christian, Christian reformed home, which, which means no, you know, we didn't listen to uh, secular music until, you know, my brother snuck in and my older brother snuck in a kiss record, I think between, you know, between a, a you know, Ray Conniff singers album and Lawrence Welk or something, you know, and, uh, and it, my mind was blown. And then... So a lot of times this kind of religious Christian, um, uh, you know, images, they find their way in all of my songs in some way. Because these, it was such an important thing to me as a, you know, as a kid. It was such a huge, not important... Um, as much as it just was prevailing, it was everything to us. You know what I mean? Until I, again, until my brother snuck in the Kiss record and suddenly <laughs> we're all sneaking in records. And then, then by that time, you know, my brother's rebelling and he's just playing whatever the hell he wants on, on you know, the family stereo. Two things come to mind is Neil Young, his quote about that rock and roll is where God are and Satan meet in the middle and shake hands. I always thought that was, <laughs> I'm paraphrasing great. the quote, but I always love that. It's great. And it's true. And then Mike Ness of Social Distortion, I remember in an interview with him, he told me that the moment that it all came together for him was he saw this painting of Christ, the crown of thorns, and it was a really almost medieval looking. And then he saw this painting of a nude woman and He's like, that's where my personality landed between those two things. <laughs> He's like, that's that was everything because I grew up Christian, but I also grew up with the whole sin thing and, and seeing sure. the other side of it. And he said, that's what I wrote about in the middle of that. I think he speaks for a lot of us. Hey, that's that's really great. I got to look that up because that's exactly how I feel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love the second verse. It starts to bring you in a little bit more as a listener. What's going on here with this mystery? My best friend took a week's vacation to forget her. Um, his girl took a week's worth of Valium and slept. His girl took a week's worth of Valium and slept. Man, that, that's one of those lines where like, whoa, did I hear what I just heard? And you go back and re-listen. I felt like I needed her to die in this. And I, like I said before, I, I do regret I, I look at the song as a song and I go, eh, I could have done that better. That was an easy out. But if I find an interesting way to do it, and I did find an interesting way to do it. So I forgive myself for that. At least I found a way to do it. Now, you know, does she have to take, you know, does she have to take a drug overdose? You know, what does she do? It seemed like the idea that she just fell asleep was much more, uh, I, I guess I could forgive myself <laughs> for that part of it. It wasn't. A, it didn't have to be a violent death. It's like the baby's breath and the shoe full of rice. You say the word abortion, and it's going to take you out of the song. <laughs> it's, you're gone. I mean, that's it. I've lost everybody. But you do the little things and tease them like that, and you say, "We took a week's worth of volume and slept." Oh, what is that? Oh, I know what that means. You know, and then suddenly, you know, people are, "Oh, wow, that's okay." So that happened. And that was the idea. That you know, if if I'm going to kill her off, I got to do it in a subtle way where people have to figure it out on their own. And it made sense to me that he took off, you know, he took off when it happened and then that's why she did it. So it implies that he was with her at the time and then left. And then when he left her, she did it. So, um, I mean, that was the idea, whether people interpret it that way or not. I, I, I don't think so. Thinks about her now and he never really wept. He says, this experience is, made you numb well you're you're you know he's in denial you know and i think that 
he never really had the opportunity to grieve. We all need that opportunity to grieve. I mean, you know that. Your, your dad died. You were close to your dad. Music, you know, if you don't take that time to grieve, then mu- it, it may have ruined music for you. I'm no psychologist, but you know what I mean. I mean, you have to be able to grieve it and let it go and get back to the things that remind uh, you of your dad. And I feel like we all feel that way. So, um for uh you know for him to not grieve and take the time to grieve and the admission of guilt uh of participation uh it's going to come back later and haunt him which is what it does in the story you know for both for both of us and we tried to wash our hands of all of this and fell through the ice fell through the ice when we tried not to slip we'd say it People would latch on to that we fell through the ice and take it literally and say, oh, does this mean this or whatever? Right. No, it's another, you know, you know, it's, again, the ambiguity. It's a metaphor. And that was from an image I saw. I was in the Army in 1983 to 1987. And that was an image that I saw at the Dusendijks in uh, Germany. This this guy, in a, he had a nice suit on. He was walking across a uh, shortcut through the Dusendijk area that, you know, but upon, and he was trying so desperately not to slip. And I was like, here he is trying not to slip. And, and he could easily fall through this. This is springtime. <laughs> and, you know, what's, why are you even doing this? You know, he's going to fall through. And I made a little note in the notebook and that kind of thing. And then these things came back later as a songwriter. How was it for you leaving it the way you did? Or was it always going to be that way? I think that once I felt like the song was finished or I was exhausted from writing it and then you lose perspective. I felt like I had to get it out there and start playing the song and to see what the reaction was going to be. And immediately I messed up the words the first time I played it. And I had a dozen people come up to me that night and say, what is that song about her touch and her face or that kind of thing? And I'm like, okay, that the song's done. Don't change a thing. What did it mean in the end? The song belonged to them. I can't go back now and change it. And when we went into the studio with Jack Joseph Puig, suddenly do I change this line or this line? Oh, no, no, no. No one would ever dare to do that. So the song is what it is. This is it. This is it for the rest of our lives. And fortunately, it's a song that I feel like I can hold my head up and say, you know what? It's a, it's a great song. And all songwriters will tell you this, I think, and you've probably heard this many times, is that I have better songs, I feel like. Yet, <laughs> you know, this is the one that everybody knows. And if they're going to know the song, know a song of yours, let it be one like this. It's why I never, I would never not play the song. It brings so much joy into people's lives. Why would I ever, you know, stop playing it and, and not embrace it? I love that. It's a great position to be in. Well, I got to tell you, your vocal parts, especially at the end, when you just kind of go off and you're not really saying anything, you're doing, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah." And when you get at the end where you, where you up and down and all, it's not, it's not a, a predictive thing, the way that you're doing it. It's just all feel. And I've always, one of my favorite vocals from the 90s is that, that song. Well, I appreciate you saying that. That's a, that's a, that's a, I take that as the highest compliment. Thank you for that. The thing about the 90s that, that was really cool is you talk about grunge and Jeremy. This song is about abortion and some of those things and then a year later brick comes out ben folds five a little different take on that as well She's a brick and, I'm drowning slowly. and there were things that were being talked about in popular music of songs that were on top 40 that were not your happy-go-lucky kind of stuff that you would usually hear on pop radio and it, it really did make you think about things from from Jeremy to to this song to like I said Brick and there's so many other examples of this. The great thing about what and what you're saying is I 100% agree. I mean, we were coming off the decade of, you know, Tiffany and that kind of thing. Seem to be 
and the and a lot of the you know a lot of the hair bands too. You know, it was all about a good time and that kind of thing. And, you know, it would have been easy for all of us to become a little too full of ourselves and pretentious and the whole thing. Uh, were we not having so much fun passing music out to each other saying, have you heard this? Have you heard this? Have you heard this? Like a crown of thorns. There was so much out there that none of us, at least in Grand Rapids, knew about. And so just enjoying being in that genre where this new thing was happening, thank God for Nirvana breaking the whole thing open. On the uh, in the mainstream, uh, that it was such an exciting time that why not pepper your songs a little bit and make people a little more socially conscious and aware of what's going on in the world, and have them think a little bit about you know have them think what the repercussions for something for their actions might be you know uh, and and like I said this you know. I think a lot of bands, a lot of bands did that. I don't think a lot of bands did it in the linear fashion that the freshman tells the story. But, um, but again, what does it matter if people walk away from listening to these songs that, you know, like Brick is a great example. Lithium. Yeah, lithium. Exactly. Like, well, suddenly, you know, I'm thinking about this when really I thought I was going to think about nothing but a good time. You know what I mean? Nothing but a good time. That's one of the reasons I love the 90s. I thought the 90s was a great decade for music for that reason. Well, there's a lot of great covers of the freshman. Mustard Plug. She fell in love in the first place. Scott Friedman, you know, the piano version. We were freshmen. Now, I always thought Bronson Arroyo, who pitched for the Red Sox, he did a cover of it. I was impressed by that, too. You know, the Mustard Plug version I really loved. And, uh, you know, they're another Grand Rapids, Michigan band where I'm from. And I tried so hard to get RCA to sign that band and to, you know, put that version out and do the whole thing. And they thought it was disrespectful. And I was like, no, it's so fun. The horn. It was, you know, it was made for trombone. <laughs> That's my favorite cover version. Though. There are quite a few. Jay Brennan's version's nice too. Listen, no higher form of compliment. I mean, it really is when somebody, you know, uh, somebody covers it. It's it's fantastic. I love it. Well, can you believe that 25 years is coming up of this song's release? It just Crazy. makes me feel old. I mean, me too. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've got teenagers that, uh, you know, don't even like the song. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, 25 years later, almost 25 years later. I mean, it's been longer than that since you wrote the song. But yeah. what what are your what are your thoughts now? Kind of wrapping up on this song. Final thoughts of of what the freshman means to you so many years later. Well, I think back. You know, my fear back then was that you know people would consider you a one hit wonder because it was such an iconic moment or piece in that in that 90s history it's like you said and so getting past all of that has been the has been so freeing to me to not worry about that the freshman's going to be my legacy as a songwriter that's that's never going to change now you know and accepting that and going yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty goddamn good song why not you know i i could have done much worse <laughs> you know, and so that's how I live my life now. I still write and enjoy it. I still, you know, we still tour and play shows. We make albums and we're able to do that because of what the freshman did. I love it. Love it. Wouldn't, wouldn't have it any other way. Hey, thanks for watching. Make sure to leave us a comment about this, this dark and haunting song. What do you remember about this alternative hit? What other uh, question or perplexing songs should we cover on here to get the real story? Let us know in the comments below. Uh, if you like our content, we do invite you to be a permanent part of our channel. 
by subscribing below. And also, if you want to check out more content, we have it on Patreon. That helps us keep the music alive. And check out our merch, our Vintage Years collection. I think you'll really like it. Help us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. <laughs>